Well, hello. You saw the timestamp on this video and you still clicked on it. <laughs> so thank you. Um, don't, you know, feel bothered to watch any longer than you want to. I, I guess I want to talk about this one for a while because uh, this is a deck I've been working on really for a number of years. And not to say that it has arrived at like a, you know, tournament competitive level, but I've just enjoyed the challenge of working with this specific version of Boromir and like trying to match certain criteria for theme while also seeing what the deck can do. So I just want to take some time and talk about what I've discovered and where the deck is. So Boromir... Um, this version is a ranger, and he says Boromir is not overwhelmed unless his strength is tripled. I've found that to be a really compelling ability, uh, basically since I remember seeing this card way back in, well, the game came out in 2001, I may have seen it in 02. Anyways, the idea that Boromir, being strength 7, would have a built-in, uh, can't be overwhelmed unless his strength is tripled, feels like Superman levels of durable because Boromir's not going to be overwhelmed without any support uh, unless a minion is strength 21. And then if you put a sword on him, um, you're immediately boosting that to like 27. So it seems like Boromir is uh, rather invincible. Um, why is it that Decipher could get away with making a card like that and why don't we see Boromir use this version of him more often? What's what's going on? Well, for starters, it's true that he can't be overwhelmed uh, unless he's in like the most dire circumstances, but he still has just the three vitality, so he's only going to lose two skirmishes to Inuric High uh, before he's down and out, so that's very true. Um, I think there's also an inherent challenge with using Boromir, who is 3 Twilight and Strength 7, meant to be a bit of like a knight role in your fellowship, meant to go out and stomp on orcs and fight minions and win, but then had this ability which makes him a really strong loser. If you are building your free people side with like a really strong invincible character, you're setting him up to go out there and survive things. It's good to have a companion who can do that. The problem is, at 3 Twilight, what does that leave for the rest of your starting fellowship, and what role are you expecting for your other companions? Um, in this fellowship setup, I'm using, of course, Frodo. This is a first block deck. And then Mary from War the Brandywine, who is strength plus two while he bears a weapon. Hobbits usually need some other person on the team who can actually be the warrior. And then hobbits are often assigned the role of speed bump. They might go out and fight the skirmishes, which we know are hopeless. Uh, go up and fight Lurts, the the strongest orc on the field, or something along those lines, and either play a stealth event and cancel the skirmish, or lose, get overwhelmed, but know that you blocked the strongest minion. That's their role. Here we have a version of Boromir who's kind of eating into that role because now his job is to go out and fight the strongest minions and not win, but rather survive. And it's still my belief that the core competency of a strong free people side is its ability to get rid of minions. So, just theoretically, I think the reason this Boromir isn't broken is because he doesn't serve the main function that a warrior companion should in his own game text. Compare him with, say, the version of Boromir which can exert to make other hobbits strength plus three. Uh, if you pair him with, say, Merry friend to Sam, who can then exert twice and add his strength to other companions, that kind of Boromir, he may not be a warrior in and of himself, but he's helping other people win skirmishes. He's helping hobbits win skirmishes. Um, he's then taking on kind of a role of a fighter. This Boromir, he can fight, 
but if he's going to, we're going to need other cards in the deck to help him out with it. All that being said, what are the good things about this Boromir? Well, we've covered that he's super, super durable. He can go out there and fight Nazgul and uh, survive very easily uh, with very little support. He's also a ranger, which gives us access to cards which spot and exert rangers and helps us at certain sites. And then he has the Aragorn Signet, so for someone who is meant to go and lose, um, if he does, then if we have Aragorn King in exile, it's very possible that at the beginning of the next turn, Aragorn can go and heal a wound off of Boromir. So that's all good. Then let's look at these other companions, Frodo Reluctant Adventurer. The cost of each artifact, possession, and Shire Tail played on Frodo is minus one. And Mary for more the Brandywine, while Mary bears a weapon, he is strength plus two. Uh, so Mary can be a hybrid kind of a skirmisher, and then survivable, kind of a hobbit too. He's very durable, that's the word I should use. Uh, and then Frodo, you can play a lot of cards on him and not pay nearly as much for them. So maybe there's some utility there. Okay, really short, really brief. What's the thematic idea behind these three companions? Like, why is this the inspiration for a deck? I think it comes down to Boromir being this really interesting character with that super heroic looking kind of ability that, that makes you think what's going on. And then the idea that if you pair him with the hobbits and then use, I'm specifically thinking about Dagger Strike, which can make either a Gondor or a Shire Companion with a hand weapon, strength plus two and damage plus one, maybe we can do a kind of Gondor Shire hybrid, which lets both cultures work as like a, a warrior, uh, a skirmish phase focused kind of a, well, two culture deck. Um, so that's what I'm thinking here. We're gonna be reaching for dagger strikes, which means we're gonna need a lot of weapons. Um, and then as a last thought, Boromir can survive things well, but one of his primary abilities is still the fact that his name is Boromir. So you can play some very strong possessions, uh, which go on Boromir specifically, and you can play both sides of the game. If Boromir needs to survive a skirmish, he can survive it really well. We'll have cards in there for that. If Boromir needs to win a skirmish, then he can win it really well, and we're gonna put it in that. So what this deck can do, I've found in playtesting, and um, at least, yeah, the, the theory behind the deck is it can both win and it can survive. It's adaptable. So it's meant to play both sides. Um, the cards in here then are going to f try to function in both ways. Does this card A help me win skirmishes and knock minions off the table? And does it also B help me survive a skirmish if my character is destined to lose in that moment? Uh, can I play both sides of the field? So let's take a look at what cards we're going to be using. First of all, for Boromir, we're going to support him with two copies of Blade of Gondor. Bearer must be Boromir, he is damage plus one. And in Skirmish, exert Boromir to wound an orc or uruk high he is skirmishing. Compare that to Aragorn Sword, um, which is, well, what we call the Ranger Sword. Aragorn's just has a strength plus two and damage plus one bonus. The Blade of Gondor is a little bit fancier uh, because it gives you the ability to wound Orcs and Urukai during the skirmish phase. So Boromir has access to this really, really cool ability to knock minions off the table as he needs. Um, and then next up, we're also going to support Boromir with two copies of Flaming Brand. And the benefit to having two uh, I mean, you could play both of them on Boromir if it came down to it, but we can also spare one for Aragorn, who's definitely going to be in this deck. And then with two copies of Blade of Gondor and two copies of Flaming Brand, we have four hand weapons available in the deck for Boromir to maximize the chances of getting the hand weapon that you need to play Dagger Strike. So in this deck, we're also going to include four copies of Dagger Strike. Make a Gondor or Shire Companion, bearing a hand weapon, strength plus two, and damage plus one. Now, 
Do weapons help companions win skirmishes? Yeah, uh, this gives Boromir a strength bonus and a damage bonus. Flaming Brand against a Nazgul, you also get a damage bonus and a very strong strength bonus. And then Dagger Strike, again, strength bonus and damage bonus. On the other side, are there circumstances where being stronger will at least help you survive something better? It, certainly. Um, you boost someone's strength, and this is especially true for the Hobbits. Um, sometimes a Dagger Strike may be the difference between getting overwhelmed or not. But, also in the right skirmishes, it could instead be the tipping point between losing and winning a skirmish, and maybe knocking a minion off of the table. So on that note, we are also going to include four copies of Hobbit Sword. And I'm including Hobbit Sword specifically up to four copies, just so that whatever I draw, like whichever of the four copies, they can go on to Frodo, they can go on to Mary, it's easy. It might be worth considering putting Sting in this deck, but in the current build, it's just as is. With four Hobbit Swords, again, we're going to maximize the chances of drawing into our Dagger Strikes. Now, I'm going to show us um, something that looks primarily defensive. So the Shield of Boromir can, it has to go on uh, a Gondor Companion, and the Minion Archer total is minus one. But... If Bearer is Boromir, each minion skirmishing him does not gain strength bonuses from weapons. There's something sneaky in there. Does this help us survive skirmishes? Yes, but if you're going to run into minions who have weapons, this could actually be the difference between losing a skirmish and winning it. You may be able to knock down the strength bonus from a minion weapon and then actually take the skirmish that way. So I really like Shield of Boromir for that purpose. Um, very similarly, since we're running sort of Shire and Gondor, I have Mithril Coat in here for Frodo. Again, we're going to reduce the minion archery total by minus one. That can come in very handy. And then each minion skirmishing Frodo does not gain strength bonuses from weapons and loses all damage bonuses. Can this help Frodo win a skirmish? Yeah. Um, I find especially, um, against like, well, I shouldn't say that, but it, it seems, well, that against a Moria Orc with, like, a Goblin Scimitar um, or a Goblin Spear, because they have such low base stats, uh, they're kind of at Frodo's level to begin with, a lot of those Orcs. And if you can take away the Strength Bonus from the weapon, combine it with a Hobbit Sword, maybe you're running there and back again, Frodo might be able to um, take out one of the Orcs. In extreme situations... Um, Maybe this could be the difference between winning and losing against an Uruk Hai. But also, most definitely, in taking away damage bonuses, this is going to help Frodo um, lose to Uruk Hai more gracefully. Uh, take away those damage bonuses. That's all fine. On that note, let's take a moment and just talk about uh, the ring. In first block, you only have two options. Uh, the ruling ring, or else a Sealdur's Bane. And a Sealdur's Bane does give you a lot of good options. In this deck, Frodo fights a lot. He's involved in a lot of skirmishes. And as you might imagine, he's going to lose a lot of those skirmishes too. Isildur's Bane is not very uh, burden efficient. If you have to put on the ring, then Frodo has to take two burdens for every wound. This just makes it simpler. If Frodo's going to put on the ring, we're just going to take one burden for each wound. Uh, so I'm just going to hold on to that ring. Okay, now here's a card which is going to break sort of the precedent we've established for going both directions. But armor, bearer takes no more than one wound during each skirmish phase. This is just about losing gracefully. With the like, meta dominance and the outright skirmish power of the uruk -hai, it's really helpful to be able to take away damage bonuses. Um, and... Because it also says, specifically, Bearer takes no more than one wound during each skirmish phase, this can also take away um, the power of some of the Sauron Orc skirmish wounding if the Orc Warrior or the Orc Scouting Band exerts and wounds, say, Boromir or Aragorn. Then, they've already taken their one wound during the skirmish phase. They can even lose against the Orc, and they're not going to take anything more. This is actually... A I find like a really, really helpful card. 
Um, I often find myself playing this on Aragorn because Boromir's out there from the beginning. He has his sword and his flaming brand and is actually a little bit of a stronger skirmisher for a while until and unless I can get the ranger's sword and or the flaming brand on Aragorn. So Aragorn's at strength eight and armor helps him yeah, lose gracefully. This is especially true because Aragorn has four vitality. With armor, he can lose three skirmishes to various uruk uh, and still he'll be A-OK. -okay. So armor's just a great card. And then while we are building in for Boromir, here is the Saga of Elendil. Just a simple vitality plus one and an optional chance to become stronger in a skirmish. So there we are again, more survivable, lose gracefully, but if needed, maybe this could be the difference between uh, winning and losing a skirmish. So there's that option. All right, then we'll get back to this. Um, we have three copies of There and Back Again. You know, Vera must be a Hobbit companion. We'll try to always put this on Frodo since he makes each Shire tail plate on him cost minus one. Discard this condition to make each Hobbit companion strength plus two until the regroup phase. With three copies in the deck, we have a greater chance of drawing and really a greater chance of using it on multiple turns. If you can give plus two to every Hobbit on the board, maybe we have Pippin or Sam, or maybe both. Uh, this could be like a six point or eight point strength difference, like going across. And then if you have Hobbit Sword on Mary and you've discarded there and back again, all of a sudden Mary's looking pretty good because he's got strength nine. Um, then if you have Dagger Strikes available, it's a lot of cards, it takes a lot of build up, but that's one thing a free people side is good at is having static uh, permanent bonuses. Once you play a sword, it stays. Once you play there and back again, it stays until you're ready to use it. Um, the last piece that's missing is then the skirmish event, which can be, of course, situational. But um, this can help us win skirmishes. Again, it can also help us survive. Hobbits are weak. A nice plus two strength bonus can be very helpful. All right. Let's look at some of our other companions. We have Aragorn, King in Exile. At the start of each of your turns, you may heal another companion who has the Aragorn Signet. Notice, Merry, Frodo, Boromir, they've all got the Aragorn Signet, so he can do a lot of healing, especially if we see our opponent play the Prancing Pony and we get the chance to actually play Aragorn at the beginning, then he's gonna do a lot of healing throughout the game. I'm giving Aragorn one copy of Ranger Sword because there's not a guarantee we're gonna find Aragorn at the beginning. We don't wanna put a lot of stuff in the deck that we're not gonna be able to play right away. If we get Ranger Sword early and we don't get Aragorn, it's possible that Ranger Sword will have to go uh, at some point while we're reconciling uh, because it's stuck in the hand. So I like to keep it ju to just one. We have the two flaming brands, um, so that can also give Aragorn uh, skirmish potential. And then if you can combine them, he's up to strength 11. So hooray, hooray. I'm also including Pippin. Uh, when you play Pippin, remove a burden or a wound a, nah, or a, <laughs> remove a burden or wound from a companion. Don't wound a companion, yeah. So he can heal or he can take a burden off of Frodo. And then Pippin is a great speed bump, so throw him against the strongest guy, let him go. And then we have Sam, son of Hamfast, exert Sam to remove a burden. If Frodo dies, make Sam the ring bearer. Though this deck tries to lean most of all on Frodo um, as the like steady, survivable, uh, durable ring bearer. So Sam is more of a, if we need to get burdens off quick, he's there. And then maybe he'll go speed bump too. And then one companion of a culture we haven't looked at yet, but Legolas Greenleaf is great as a splash companion, doesn't need further support. He can just go and point, click, delete minions during the archery phase. Um, and then he may lose in a skirmish. That's all right. This deck um, 
is gonna run basically on the thought of keeping to five companions at a time. Ideally, our core four companions are gonna be Aragorn, Boromir, Frodo, and Merry. And then our fifth companion will be one of these three, and then they can go as needed um, during the skirmish phase against a strong minion, having done like what they've set out to do. So those are our companions for the deck. We just have seven. Um, this is really a small deck. We're running 32 Free Peoples and 32 Shadow. So we have Pippin, Sam, and Legolas. I'm going to put them in the glare zone. Very glary. All right. Then a few fun tricks. Um, Pursuit just behind. Boromir is a ranger. So even if we don't draw into Aragorn, we have access to this. Exert a ranger companion to wound every minion. This can clear table uh, at the end of a site so that you had the chance to go on to the next one if you're ready for a double move. And then one copy of Power According to His Stature, which is particularly good, of course, against Moria Swarms. If Frodo is facing two or three or four one Vitality Moria Orcs, then you play this and just knock them all over so that's a really good one. And then I'm running just one copy of Sentinels of Numenor. Make a Gondor companion strength plus two or plus four in a fierce skirmish. There's, there's another one that I really like. Um, I believe it's Swordsman of the Northern Kingdom, which is make a ranger strength plus two or plus four against a roaming minion. Boromir again is a ranger, Aragorn's a ranger, and you're going to see roaming minions, unless you're up against just Nellier at, like, site two. I mean, there's always a chance for that card, but eventually minions stop roaming. Sentinels of Numenor has the advantage of becoming strong in the late game, uh, especially in site seven, eight, nine, if you're fighting Isengard, Urukai, if uh, Sauron shows up and you have fierce skirmishes to deal with, this can become strong still at later sites. Um, it gives companions uh, an opportunity to really put in the damage. Um, now, up to this point, uh, I know the table's a bit of a mess right now. This has been 29 cards. And in previous versions of this deck, I've included um, more copies of Sentinels of Numenor, possibly up to three or maybe two of this and two of Pursuit just behind. I discovered a danger for this deck. Um, I had a, a local tournament a couple months ago and ran into a Sauron exertion wound uh, destruction deck with Orc Bowman and Under the Watching Eye. And A, I found that um, I was letting Frodo have too many burdens and putting myself in danger in addition to all those Sauron conditions of Enquie, uh coming out and making a really big nuisance of himself. And B, I was playing the six companions, so Enquie wouldn't necessarily need the burdens anyways, but also running into Site 8 where you, you may have to add two to the minion archery total for each companion over four. Late game, I was just getting destroyed. But the biggest contributing factor was the consistent pressure put on by these Sauron conditions. Under the Watching Eye and Orc Bowman. I don't want to get rid of what this kind of deck is, but how do you get conditions off the table if you're not going to run uh, Gandalf? This is a Shire Gondor culture deck. There's not a lot of access to condition removal. You could think of adding in elf allies and playing like secret sentinels, but that's going to require, I don't know, maybe three elf allies just to start to be consistent, and then two or three copies of secret sentinels. That's a lot. I think what I'm going to go with, uh, and I truly haven't play tested this out yet, but it occurred to me um, that with our three copies of There and Back Again, and our copy of the Saga of Elendil. Uh, we already have four tails in the deck. Yeah, there we go. 
So one, two, three, four. Uh, these are all tails. And uh, there is Bilbo Baggins, uh, who is in the glare spot. Okay, well-spoken gentle hobbit. Uh, exert Bilbo and discard a tail to discard a shadow condition from an opponent's support area. This is not super efficient. If you were running Gandalf, you could play Sleep Karadras and discard every condition. You might be late game and there are three orc bowmen and four under the watching eye and he's gonna clear the whole table. This is not nearly as powerful, but it does give you access with the way that the deck is already built to take advantage of the deck structure and still stay efficient. Um, so Bilbo Baggins can take advantage of the Saga Valendil, there and back again, get rid of those. And then, because I, I love going for thematic stuff, this gives me finally an opportunity to use a card that I've never used before, but Stone Trolls. So we're gonna have did that. We're gonna have two copies of Bilbo Baggins. That gives us an opportunity to spot Bilbo. So Stone Trolls to play, spot Bilbo, plays on any character, limit one per character. Each time Bearer skirmishes a troll, or Uruk High, yeah, Bearer is strength plus three. This costs two, but for one thing it's a tail, so if you're not fighting Uruk High, um, it's just another thing for Bilbo to get rid of. And at the very least we have Frodo, who can make it cost minus one, so it's not going to be as expensive. Um, maybe you are running against Sauron Orcs, you just throw it on Frodo, exert Bilbo, get rid of it, throw away one of the under the watching eye. Z. But if you are going against Uruk High, um, you have options. You could put this on Boromir, and then along with his sword and the flaming brand, he's like a strength 13 uh, superhero just going out and smashing Uruk High. And that's awesome. Alternatively, because this deck really does turn Frodo into a spirited companion. If you put Stone Trolls on Frodo against an Uruk High deck, his base strength is now going to be seven, like Boromir's is seven. Give Frodo a Hobbit Sword, and then he's got a base strength of nine. You could, with, with a base strength of nine, that's going to match the strength of most of the Uruk High, the Uruk Warriors, the Uruk Captains, um, Uruk Lieutenant, and... I'm forgetting the names, but you know, Yurk Ragers, etc., etc. Most of them are strength nine. This gives Frodo a, a chance to be like toe to toe with them and then see what might happen with their back again, dagger strike, and so on. So, um, I'm not saying this is like really, really strong or competitive, but it just makes me happy. I think this is fun. And Bilbo is an old favorite character of mine, so the chance to use him and like have a, a specific purpose for him in the deck feels good and it might just work. Now I'm thinking about Sauron specifically because I've realized um, this deck has a weakness to their heavy wounding, but Bilbo just at the right time could also take out like a really well stocked goblin swarms, just knock the tower over and get rid of all the orcs uh, waiting there. Not that we're losing any skirmishes, right? Um, <laughs> letting the goblin swarms, but yeah, it happens. So uh, Bilbo can go out there and take that out. And I mean, you know, name any shadow condition you don't want to see on the board. Bilbo gives you a chance. And we're not really changing the infrastructure of the deck. We already have tails built into it and gives us a chance to add in another one. Okay, I want to just lay out the companions a second and think through a few things here, like broad strokes for the deck. Um, one, I've already mentioned that the thought is you want to run with just five companions at a time, uh, protect yourself from Enquie, from Site 8 being particularly, you know, mean, uh, adding tons to the archery total. That's true. Like, we're gonna try to hold to that. Notice again, we have Aragorn, Aragorn, Aragorn. Aragorn Signet, so Aragorn can heal a lot, especially if you get him out early. But the inherent challenge of running Boromir, as we mentioned before, 
as a durable companion rather than specifically a strong skirmisher until you get the right cards on him, which does happen eventually, means that at the beginning of the game, um, you're not knocking minions off the board like a good fellowship should. Uh, a good free people's deck should be sending them away, and this one is not. At the beginning of the game, this, this free people's side is weak. It just is. So, um, what does that mean for uh, bidding and for like using this deck in the first place? Well, it means this deck really wants to go second. Um, bid zero burdens, let your opponent play whatever site they're going to play. Hopefully it's the Prancing Pony and we get to see Aragorn, but the Green Dragon Inn shows up a lot, so we may get to play out Sam. And the cards are really stacked more towards Boromir than they are towards Aragorn. So we do have someone who's eventually going to become like super heroic as long as he stays alive. And he's good at staying alive. Looking at our sights just really quick at the beginning, I do have a Prancing Pony in case we should happen to go first, so we can pull Aragorn. But at sight two, uh, Etten Moors, with nothing else in our hand, if we drew just like eight shadow cards, exert a companion or a minion to make that character strength plus two, like Frodo or Mary with four vitality, they can do a lot to keep themselves from getting overwhelmed. Um, Boromir doesn't really need help with that, but you know, suppose our opponent played Green Dragon in, Sam can also benefit from this. So our sight two can keep us alive for quite a while. And then I'm running Rivendell Waterfall. While you can spot a ranger at Rivendell Waterfall, the move limit is plus one for this turn. So Boromir is in our starting fellowship. He should survive till site three. This gives us a chance, if we dare, and if we've set up well by the second, by our second turn, to maybe jump ahead. It's possible that we've finally gotten the weapons that we need and that um, we can hop from site three to site six. Not at all a guarantee, not worth risking it just for the sake of doing it, but it's an opportunity. It's out there. It's true that you also give your opponent the opportunity too, but uh, the shadow side for this deck finally starts clicking around site four, because we are running Moria. Um, it's a worthwhile trade-off, and again, it gives Boromir's ranger keyword, like, a good reason for being there in the first place. So, we start off weak, we spend our first free people's turn surviving, and then something starts to happen. So, we have our, our shield, and maybe Aragorn has an armor, and... Like, you know, none of this is guaranteed, but um, hopefully Boromir has his Blade of Gondor. You may be fortunate enough to have a Flaming Brand on there. Frodo's got there and back again. We've got a Hobbit Sword. And then there's, there's much more in the deck that we've seen. This is generally true of many Fellowships because they have, um, I guess I would call it object permanence. Um, Free people's cards, unlike the shadow cards, don't get discarded at the end of the turn. Because this fellowship is good at surviving, and that's not the core competency of a good fellowship, but because they are good at surviving, their cards are good at staying. What this deck does well, even though it has weaknesses at the beginning, this deck does late game play really, really well. Um, you're gonna cycle through your deck and eventually the right cards are gonna show up and Boromir's gonna have a damage bonus. And unless Ranger's Sword is hiding at the very bottom, Aragorn's gonna have that damage bonus too. Uh, we have our Dagger Strikes going there and back again. And we're living for the skirmish phase. Um, we've turned Boromir and even Frodo and Merry, and then of course Aragorn into skirmish capable warriors. And we're just, letting the uruk rush at us and taking them head on. Um, so yeah, that's the summary of it. 
bid zero burdens. Let your opponent go first. You don't want to rush out there. Um, give yourself uh, some shelter with Etten Wars, and then let your fellowship build. Let your free people side start to gain traction. And towards the end of the game, they're going to be surprisingly powerful. Um, and then just as a last thought, thematically, it holds together. Like the goal for this deck was Boromir as centerpiece. And we have, I mean, how many cards for him? He can have his Blade of Gondor. He can have the Flaming Brand. He can have the Saga of Elendil. He's got his shield. If it came down to it, he could have an armor. And notice that in first block, there is absolutely no Grimma Wormtongue. I even thought about uh, Boromir's Cloak, throwing that on there, because who wants to deal with Sauron Snows? But, no, no, no. Um, just doesn't quite fit. But yeah, Boromir can eventually become, like, as we've said, a superhero. Um, that stuff is out there. And then Frodo with a Mithril Coat and a Hobbit Sword, and a there and back again, throwing out power according to his stature, and dagger strikes just going left and right and maybe a well-timed stone trolls um there's just a lot of fun going on in this deck the shire and the gondor cultures are working together and at 32 cards the the free people's side is really efficient you're gonna get almost everything you want by and towards the end of the game when it matters so that's what's going on here um, a very durable deck, and a deck that you want to take slow. It starts weak. It's okay that it starts weak. Take it just a sight at a time. I don't mean you have to move one side at a time, but, like, just wait. Watch what happens. So that's what's going on for this deck. Uh, we will get to more of the sights later, but let's take a moment and look at our shadow side. So I am running... Strictly because I want to, <clears throat> and that's mostly been the motivation for the free people side too, Moria Archers. Moria Archers are not the top of the meta. They're not super competitive. I think they're fun. Uh, I've always been a big fan of archery, um, especially of like elven archers. I just like archery as a mechanic. Go out there, shoot, see what happens. All right, so I've got six, sorry, <laughs> four, but I mean, sure, I got six copies, why not? Because I've got hosts of thousands, yeah. So I've got eight copies of Moria Archer Troop, if you will. Um, while you can spot another Moria Archer, add one to the minion archery total. Um, this guy is very expensive and has only eight strength, but what does he have going for him? Well, with three vitality, he can soak up a lot of free people's archery, for one thing. But also, we're going to be running four copies of Moria Axe. Bearer must be a Moria Orc. Bearer is damage plus one. Exert Bearer to make him strength plus two. So if you get this on this, he's a strength ten minion. He, he's expensive. They are expensive. For six, only getting eight power, but then the axe is just one. Then combined, you've got a strength 10 minion, damage plus one, with the ability to become up to strength 14. And there's a kind of card efficiency where he can put out two archery instead of just one, as long as you can spot another archer. Um, so even a simple combination of a Moria archer troop and a goblin bowman, bowman, is going to give you three archery total. Um, as I mentioned, we have four copies of Hosts of Thousands. Most of the time, I like drawing into more copies of Moria Archery Troop, because this is the archery engine of the deck for sure. But, you know, there are other orcs in here and different things come up. So, we got two copies of Goblin Scavengers, which can let us play weapons from the discard pile. And then I really like making some space. Goblin Flankers. I'm given four copies of those. They cost five, but again, we have three vitality. And this time, 11 strength. The trade-off is they're not archers, but with the Moria Axe, 
they can become really scary. And then they're great for the double move because if the Fellowship has moved on more than once this turn, when you play the Goblin Flankers, you can add three. So effectively, they can become uh, a cost of two for an 11 strength, three vitality orc. Uh, then I like, I don't know if I like, but I'm giving him another chance. The Archer Commander, something feels off about this guy when I play him. He doesn't always do what I want him to. Theoretically, each other Moria Archer is strength plus two, so he can give another boost to them. Um, I'm also running an Ancient Chieftain. He does work well. For each other orc you can spot, Ancient Chieftain is strength plus one. Both of these minions have more than one vitality. So this is a pretty durable Moria side. Um, yes, we have our one vitality minions, but like Moria has a reputation for being very susceptible to free people's archery fire. This deck sticks around pretty well. I've got a copy of Goblin Swarms, um, because if your orc wins a skirmish, you can put it on here. Yes, um, obviously conditions can get discarded. It's worth the possibility of being able to stack minions there, because then you get, like, a tower of bad guys going. Uh, and then I'm also running four Goblin Scimitars. Uh, when you play this possession, you may draw a card. Um... This deck has gone through some overhauling, so I have not yet, uh, and you can let me know what you think in the comments, but I have not yet run together four Goblin Scimitars and four Moria Axes, but here's what I'm thinking. Um, I had been running Drums in the Deep previously because an unexpected skirmish boost at just the right time can be a surprise overwhelm, but I found running against Shire Stealth events, um, uh, your opponent can shut down the skirmish phase before you even get a chance to play your skirmish event, and then it's sitting there in your hand, and um, you might want to discard another card when you're reconciling, but you kind of also want to discard that one. Goblin Scimitar is free, you just play it, it even lets you draw a card, so lots of efficiency there, and it's just, it's there, it's available. Even if your skirmish gets cancelled, you played it. Moria Axe is just too good a card. Um, damage bonus, lots of extra skirmish strength boosting potential. So, really, really good. This is 32 cards, and addressing the elephant in the room, there is not any more, as I had been running, three copies of uh, Goblin Armory which is each time you play a weapon, you can add a Twilight to the pool. And so if you have like three copies of it, you play one Scimitar, you can add like three. That's incredible. And then you can also discard it to prevent a wound to an orc. I may be totally wrong. And I, I respect like the, the play history that that card has. I know it's a good card. It might not be a good card for like my play style, or I just need to learn to wield it better. Something about it hasn't been working for me in my play testing. Um, I draw one copy, maybe two eventually, and then the Twilight that I'm adding to the pool doesn't seem to make a huge difference for me. To be totally honest, these are like really expensive. This is the key of the deck and he's six. This is not a Twilight Efficient Moria deck. Okay, so Goblin Armory should help with that and make it more efficient. But, oh, it's it's a card that adds Twilight and helps with Twilight efficiency when I might rather just have the skirmish bonus that I'm looking for from the weapon itself. Once you add in Goblin Armory, you have to decide what to take out. And maybe you don't take out weapons and you take out minions instead, but, oof, I mean, running the Host of Thousands and the Axes and the Scimitars and the Goblin Swarms, eventually if you start taking away minions, the problem is you don't have the bad guys who the support cards are supposed to go on to. Um, I also found myself <laughs> particularly frustrated by um, the condition removal 
specifically the last time I played of Albert Dreary. Um, exert, discard a Moria or Isengard condition, and just watching the Goblin Armories go away. Um, that's always a risk if you're going to play conditions. I don't know, and you can remind me, I don't know right now of what um, Moria condition protection there is available, like what cards keep conditions from getting removed, but I... Yeah, for a card that's waiting as a setup to add Twilight and to prevent wounds, but not immediately giving you a benefit, um, it's hard just then watching it go before you've gotten much out of it. These orcs, they're throwing out archery, they've got the weapons to back them up, they're rough and ready to skirmish, to win, to throw out the wounds, um, yeah. I think Goblin Armory is especially helpful in a big Moria deck. If you are running the Swarm angle with the Goblin Runners and the Moria Scouts, and sure, the Goblin Flankers and the Goblin Pursuers and the uh, Goblin Wall Crawlers and every other, like, standard core orc that you can think of, and, like, four co copies of the Goblin Scavengers and... The scimitar is really your cornerstone weapon instead of the Moria Axe. And you've got They Are Coming, and you've got Goblin Swarms, and you've got Goblin Armory, and you've got maybe Plundered Armories, maybe not. You've got Relics of Moria. You can have like a shadow side that's maybe 45, 50 cards, and it's this monster that grows and grows, and the, it's really good at late game stuff. Um, by site 9, you're starting with 8 cards in your hand, but you're throwing down scimitars out of your discard pile with Goblin Scavengers from Host of Thousands, drawing cards, adding 3 Twilight, or 4, or what have you, and, um, you know, discarding with their coming, and getting more orcs out of your discard pile, and just cycling and cycling. Yeah, we know what the Moria strategy is all about. Goblin Armories is a great card. I wonder if, with this deck being meant for efficiency, especially for the free people side, and with these minions being meant for skirmish, um, well, for really going out as single minions and winning skirmishes, just bullying people not as a swarm strategy, but as individual warriors on the table. I wonder if that's the reason uh, Goblin Armory hasn't been working as well for me is it's meant to be like the oil in a well-designed Moria Swarm machine, and that's not what this deck is. Um, and I could just be totally wrong, and I go out and play test this the next time and think, why did this not work? Well, because you're running a Moria Archery deck for one thing. Yeah, but for another, it's just not that giant kind of a thing. There's my rant and my ramble. Um, obviously, feel free to tell me like where I'm wrong because I would love to know how to use that card better, maybe how to protect it, um, what other uses are for it, and maybe the condition removal that exists for Free People's Side isn't as big of a problem as I'm imagining, but by making space this is my last thought on all of this. This is my last thought in the rant. By making space in this deck for minions and weapons, by taking the goblin armories out, I'm kind of removing the risk of the free people's condition removal that might exist by just playing cards that don't get discarded quite so easily. Um, possession removal exists, sure, but it's not nearly as leaned upon as condition removal is. Um, and then, again, we're just skirmish dominant. I do have the Goblin Swarms. It is a condition. It can get removed. Being the only condition, it will be a big target. And a lot of good free people sides will have ways to deal with it. But just in the right situation, I mean, Goblin Swarms works so well. So, there it is. Okay.
in a deck which is designed free people side to bid zero, go second, your minions are up to bat first. And, you know, I have Etten Moors going on as my site too. Notice with this particular brand of Moria, um, we have, again, vitality filled. That didn't make sense. But minions with lots of vitality. These guys have three. These guys have three. Archer Commander's got two. Ancient Chieftain has two. So even without the axes, the minions are ready at the beginning to, like, use Etten Moors to at least try to win a skirmish and stay around for the next site so they have a little bit of staying power. Uh, site 3 doesn't do them any favors. I don't know if there is a Site 3 that specifically benefits, benefits Moria in a sneaky way. I'm fairly confident there's not a single Site 3 that mentions the Moria culture, you know, by name in its game text. Once you get to Site 4 and your minions are ceasing to roam and the free people side has been going it kind of slow, you should get the chance to play Great Chasm. And finally, these really expensive minions. I'm making a mess. Let me just clear table for a second. So the Great Chasm, it costs four vitality and it's underground, which doesn't specifically key off any game text on these minions. But um, the Twilight cost of the first Moria Archer played each shadow phase is minus two. And then four, this is the most expensive site four available for your adventure path. So this finally gives you a chance to play some of those expensive minions and get the archery going. Um, continuing on, site five is the same for everybody. Um, then site six, Dimrel Dale. You may still be behind with the free peoples and playing your own sites on the adventure path. So it only costs three, but it does at least make another Moria orc cost minus two. So some more twilight efficiency. Hooray, hooray. Yeah, sites four to six, the machine starts working. By this point in the game, you know, things can happen. Um, all kinds of situations. You may start to overtake uh, your opponent with the free peoples. But if they're moving ahead to site seven before you and you play it, Anduin Confluence, Confluence, when the Fellowship moves to Anduin Confluence, discard every ally. There are lots of decks that rely on allies really, really strongly, um, and there are lots of good allies out there. This just wholesale ends all of, well, all of the ally support. So go away. This is a really nice one. I'm going to experiment with Shores of Nen Hithoel, not for its game text. I like this. Um, Shadow is nine Twilight, so we have really, really expensive orcs. Gives you a chance to play more of them. Um, I will say, uh, as a free people's player, consider if you're up against Moria, especially if you see your opponent playing Moria, that this is going to be their site eight. Consider at site six trying your very best to go from site six to eight directly. So that when this plays, you've already done the work and you're ending your turn there. And then you have the chance on the next turn to move to site nine. Um, you don't want to move on to uh, like site seven, stop. And then try to move site eight and nine and then see this go down and be like, ooh. Now, if your opponent is moving ahead of you, certainly, then if you're using this card, it's a guarantee that it's there, you know it's coming. Um, yeah, try to move to Site 8 as quick as you can. But 9 Twilight is awesome. And then finally, um, I have been running Summit of Amon Hen, I think, for the longest time with this deck for Site 9, which is 8 Twilight, and then you can draw a card for every burden. Um, the Moria Archery deck doesn't specifically add burdens unless you're... Uh, running into a Sildur's Bane, and they're soaking up archery wounds that way. And this deck moves through very fast. Um, you know, 32 cards, 32 cards. It, it's very efficient. I'm going to try, and I think this could be a strong play. Um, Emin Wheel, by the time 
if your opponent is moving to site 9 ahead of you and you're playing this one, then clearly this is the end of the game. Um, your shadow side has to win it for you or you lose the game. Um, so this is all about what are we working with with our shadow side. Now maneuver, exert a minion to make that minion fierce until the regroup phase. Again, this brand of Moria Archery has plenty of minions with plenty of vitality. So if you stacked on the archery wounds and you have Moria Archery troops out there and goblin flankers, um, they can exert and become fierce. And that might just be the difference. Um, you can throw out last minute archery. Maybe you win some skirmishes and with Moria axes, gain those damage bonuses. You might be able to clear a few companions off the table and then in the fierce skirmish, uh, have a chance to win the game. Uh, so I think, a, yeah, this could be a good play for the Moria strategy. Uh, I'm going to try it out the next time I get to play with this deck. Again, there's not a site none that I can think of that mentions the Moria culture by name, but I think there's a space strategically for making the orcs that you have on the table be fierce. All right. So we are at uh, almost an hour. Thank you so much for uh, watching, and um, I hope you have enjoyed. I have enjoyed working with this deck. I've enjoyed playing with it. Um, I'm looking forward to the next time I get to use it and uh, see what these changes make a difference with and whether I've gone completely off the deep end and Bilbo doesn't matter and conditions don't need to be removed and uh, I really miss Goblin Armory or what have you. But what I get out of this deck is I really get to make my Free People's Companions uh, skirmish capable companions. They get to go out and endure well if they lose, but they also get to win plenty of the time, including our Hobbit companions who can become um, very strong, at least for the Shire culture. And then we have a few uh, tricks up our sleeve. Um, well, at least uh, the Pursuit Just Behind and Power According to a Stature, fun cards. And then the Moria Archery is um, very, uh, I would say, redundant. We have the four copies of the Moria Archery Troop. We have the four hosts of thousands. We have four Moria Axes, four Goblin Scimitars, four Goblin Flankers. So turn after turn, provided there's Twilight on the board, we're going to put out minions with plenty of vitality, give them a chance to exert to add during the skirmish phase with Moria Axes, uh, hopefully stay on the board and put on the pressure if the Free People's side is looking to move for a second site. Um, and then, you know, do some basic warrior recursion so goblin scavengers can go out there, play weapons from the discard pile. Um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> so anyways, I will say again, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for watching.